Welcome to today's IG Live, and it's a Friday, so, but it doesn't really feel like Fridays anymore. It's either a Friday, or I don't even know, is it 2022, or is it 2019? It just, everything is like in chaos at the moment. We After six weeks, or more, now it's like seven weeks of lockdown, you, days become nights, become the next day, become weekends. There's no such thing as a weekend. It's like this permanent weekend. I wake up and I feel like I do things. And then the next thing I know, it's 5 p.m. And I've already started binge watching TV. And then I sleep and just repeat the cycle again. And it's not Monday through Friday. It's now seven days a week. And I forget to return phone calls. And everyone's saying, oh, you've got to be productive every single day. And I'm like, oh, no, I wasn't productive this day. But... I do like looking at the data. I do like figuring out what's going on in the economy. And I'm, I think now is a good time to work on creative projects or to start new businesses. And I'm always happy to share uh, what I'm working on and what I'm looking at. And I also want to, uh, I also want to answer any questions. So Jay's going to start collecting questions, and then he will send me the link. And uh, you know, but first I want to say it's very interesting to look at what people are worried about every day. And you could kind of see that on the CNN headlines or the Yahoo Finance headlines, wherever you get your news. So, you know, today on CNN, again, uh, you know, I don't even understand the headlines. So one headline is Trump is peddling dangerous cures for coronavirus. I guess he said something that uh, could possibly be, you know, oh, you should inject Clorox or Lysol. I don't know if he did or he didn't, but I seriously doubt he would be suggesting people do this without a doctor. I haven't looked at the video yet, though. Um, and then FDA warns of serious side effects from drugs touted by Trump. Is Trump all of a sudden like a pharmacist? Like, is he actually recommending people do this and, and the doctors are saying don't and he's arguing with them? I don't know. But it seems like there's something happening there. Joe Biden's wife, Jill Biden, says Michelle Obama should be her husband's Running mate, if you're Michelle Obama, why would you want to be, you're so much more powerful now than the vice president of the United States. The vice president of the United States historically does nothing. There is, there's only one, there's two mentions of the vice president in the constitution. One is they break ties in the US Senate. And I don't know when the last time was that they actually broke a tie. And the second thing they do is they replace the president if the president dies or is, you know, so sick that the president can't, you know, do the, the duties of the office. So the vice president is like a demotion. Michelle Obama, you know, I, I don't want to get into the argument whether Barack did a, a good job or not, but clearly he was a well-liked president. There was no serious scandals under his term. So Michelle Obama is riding this huge wave of adulation and love. They've got Netflix deals. They clearly have money. They're buying, you know, mansions everywhere. So why would she want to be vice president and then, God forbid, president? It seems to me the worst thing about being president of the United States is you're going to have to, at some point, make a decision to kill someone else. And that seems like, or, or even worse, to make a decision that will send Americans to their possible deaths. So like, you know, W and Obama uh, sent people abroad to fight wars that most of America doesn't even want to be in and American citizens died. So it seems like a horrible thing to be president. And then half the country hates you every day. You know, we act like, we act like everything is uh, polarized right now, that, that, that everybody either loves Trump and hates the other side or everybody loves Biden and hates the other side. But this is not new for the United States. Like even, even back to 1799 or 1800, you know, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, they despised each other. People who loved John Adams, they actually wanted to maybe even change the rules of the electoral college so Thomas Jefferson wouldn't get elected. And, and Thomas Jefferson didn't like John Adams. So John Adams passed this law, the Alien and Sedition Acts, which made it illegal to criticize the president of the United States. He made that law while he was president. So if there was a campaign ad, like one guy put up an ad 
comparing John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. It was like a campaign ad. And the guy got arrested and spent six months in jail for making a campaign ad that supported Thomas Jefferson. So now people are like complaining, oh no, Twitter took down my tweet because blah, 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 I mentioned something. But people were going getting thrown in jail in the United States for, for criticizing the president in 1800. And you would think, oh, well, that's 200 years ago, 220 years ago. Yeah, but it was after, you know, the Constitution has freedom of speech. And the Supreme Court at that point wasn't yet determining what laws were constitutional or not. That actually is not in the Constitution, that that's a function of the Supreme Court. It became... Uh, a few years later, kind of a standard for the Supreme Court, but it's not in the Constitution. So nobody went around and said, oh no, the Alien and Sedition Acts are illegal. So John Adams made this law and just started throwing people in jail for criticizing him. Imagine if that law existed now, and we have the same Constitution, so the law could potentially exist, And but you know, it seems inconceivable, but everyone's criticizing how, oh, YouTube is taking down videos that the World Health Organization doesn't approve, which by the way, seems ridiculous. Why, why trust the World Health Organization? It's, it seems like they lie half the time anyway. But okay, YouTube's doing that. And Twitter censoring stuff. LinkedIn actually even um, censored or shadow banned an article I even wrote, but I think it's the algorithms are going crazy. So again, it used to be humans were the censors and now it's the algorithms, the data is the censors. And it kind of goes along with the trend in every industry that things are moving from humans to algorithms. And so we'll see uh, what happens with freedom of speech and censorship, but it's certainly not freedom of speech when, I, when a company says you can't say that because I don't know, companies are allowed to do that. But if you get, if you get thrown in jail for saying something, that's another issue. So anyway, Jay, I, you're gonna start sending me uh, uh, links. Okay. Ask, feel free to ask questions to, to Jay. So, uh, what else did I want to talk about? Oh, I wanted to also talk about, I've been getting all these emails from lawyers. And so it seems like a big thing now. Lawyers trying to stay in business, I guess, or maybe their business is over lawyers. I'm getting nonstop emails. And I know Robin, my wife is listening to this. I'm getting nonstop emails from divorce lawyers who are like, you know, call us if you're getting a divorce because I guess divorces really are spiking. I mentioned the other day, a friend of mine is a private investigator and my friend's been getting nonstop calls from people who wanna hire them to see if their husband or wife is cheating. So I got two emails in a row, this must be a thing because I got two emails in a row. Uh, the first email said 24, right now 24% of dating site users. So one, one out of four people who are using dating sites right now are cheating on their spouses during the quarantine period. They're like leaving their house, going someplace else, cheating on their spouse, and then coming home. So again, that disobeys obviously the social distancing, but now you can expose your spouse potentially. If you, if you cheated on your spouse with someone with coronavirus, you could potentially expose your spouse now to coronavirus, but uh, that's horrible. But what struck me was that it's one out of four people using dating sites are actually not only cheating on their spouse and they're using Tinder, whatever. They're not only cheating on their spouse, but they're doing it during the quarantine and social distancing's out the window when it comes to sex apparently. And then I got right after that, I got an email about, uh, I've got an email, let me see if I can find it. Oh yeah, five ways to protect yourself from divorce and how your business partner's divorce can impact your firm. Dis divorce attorney available. So here's the five ways to protect yourself from divorce. Number one, form an LLC, trust or corporation and move all of your business assets into that corporation so your wife or spouse or whatever can't get them if you get a divorce. So I did not do number one. Number two, sign a prenuptial agreement. So I remember reading in a, uh, a book in the 90s uh, by a successful young man named Donald Trump. It was a book called The Art of the Deal. And he said, everybody should sign a pre prenuptial agreement. I have never signed a prenuptial agreement. I did, not, I did not do that in this divorce either. So now number one, number two, I did not do. Number three, keep your spouse out of the business. Well, my wife 
owns part of all my business. So I did not do one, two or three. Pay yourself a competitive salary. So this way you get money out of the business that your spouse doesn't get. I do not do that. I do not do number four. And number five, pay off your spouse. So if you're unable to protect your business and your spouse is now entitled to an interest in the company, you could potentially pay off your spouse. That's, I don't know, that's the obvious advice, but hopefully I'll never have to do that. I don't plan on it. This is my third marriage and I'm planning on this being my last marriage and I have never once used a dating app, so no worries there. But let's see if there's any questions yet and then we'll get into more stuff. Uh, do you have a way of resting your willpower? So rest, so willpower is something very interesting. So we think of willpower usually in terms of something like diet or exercise. So in the mornings, we wake up and we say, oh no, 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 I'm on a diet, I'm just gonna have one egg today. But by the evening, we're binge watching, you know, whatever the latest show, we're binge watching Tiger King and we can't help snacking. Because during the day, and this is, this is true, during the day, willpower depletes. So you have less uh, ability to, to say no to something that you want. You have, a, you have less ability to stick to a diet, to stick to an exercise plan. So whatever you need willpower for, make sure you get it done in the morning. And then when you, oh, hey, Wally, I've gotta call you back. I always mean to call you back every day. Just mentioned, Jay mentioned that you're here. Wally Green on the IG Live, best ping pong player in the country. And Wally, I just finished the book and I delayed calling everybody back until this week. So now I'm starting to finally call people back. Best ping pong player in the country, hello Wally. And Wally has been played ping pong in North Korea. So I'm about to talk about North Korea for a second. Because I read one article that said, uh, North Korea is gonna dissolve in violence if Kim Jong if Kim Jong Un dies. Why would why would North Korea dissolve into violence if the most violent leader they've ever had dies? That I don't know. So anyway, the, the best way to rest willpower is the obvious. Go to sleep. Your will your willpower rejuvenates if you sleep eight hours. And so in the morning when you wake up, you'll have you'll have all your full store of willpower. That's why eight hours of sleep are important. Um, what are your tips for couples during quarantine? I think, you know, everybody all goes around and says, well, did you do, or were you productive today? Did you write a novel today? Did you work on your business idea? I think at the end of every day, you should also ask, and I need to do this as well. You should also ask, were you a good husband today? Were you a good wife today? Were you a good parent today? These are the things that are going to matter 20 years from now. It's kind of obvious when you say it, but I know there's been some days, particularly while I was writing this book, there's been some days that all of a sudden it's 11 o'clock at night and I feel like I just woke up. And if I had to answer the question, was I a good husband that day? Was I a good father? The answer is no. So I'm trying really hard to be better, better than that. Thoughts on debt. So I think in general, you shouldn't borrow money for speculation. Like you shouldn't borrow money to buy stocks. You shouldn't borrow money to buy a house or you know minimal amount of money to buy a house. I, I don't think you should buy a house at all. But uh, in general, I think it's a good idea to take on debt when interest rates are low and you're making an income. Don't take student loan debt because then you're you have to make sure whatever you're borrowing money for needs to have, if you're borrowing $10, you need to get $15 in value out of it or $20 in value out of it. So if I borrow money to take a photography course, let's say the photography course costs $2,000, I borrow $2,000, let's say at 5% interest, so you know I owe an extra $100 a year, but what if I knew I can get a wedding gig, I'm gonna photograph weddings for $3,000, well that's a 50% return each year on my initial $2,000 investment. So uh, always borrow money at low interest rates if you're pretty, confident, like let's say more than 90% confident that you're gonna get value from that loan. So I would always, I would always, right now those interest rates are almost zero in some cases. So if you could borrow money for 0% interest or two, like if you could get this PPP loan, the small business loan, you absolutely should max it out. If you can get an emergency release loan, uh, emergency relief loan, you should max it out. Borrow as much money as you can always off of low interest rates. Now the flip side of that, the other end of that is pawn shops. So you go to a pawn shop and let's say I have something valuable like 
Oh, and then a pawn. The pawn shop business model, by the way, is the best business model. I go into a pawn shop and, I, and, and many people use pawn shops if they can't get loans from traditional banks. So I go to a pawn shop and I say, hey, I need to borrow $100. And the pawn shop, they're not gonna just lend me $100 like, like banks do. They'll lend me the $100, but only if I give them $100 worth or more than $100 worth of collateral. So if I say, well, look, I've got this James Altucher bogglehead that says, that has a picture of James Altucher on it. That's worth at least $200. And the pawn shop will say, okay, we'll lend you, it's worth $200. Actually, we think a James Alvitra bottle is probably worth $1,000, but we'll lend you $100 and we'll charge you 17% interest. And, uh, or if you don't pay us back in 60 days, uh, this, plus the 17%, we're gonna sell the bottle head for $1,000 on eBay. So when a pawn shop's a great business because they know what everything costs because they just look on eBay and they'll see almost everything you could possibly pawn, like a gold watch, is on eBay and they see, oh, I can. I know I can get at least $1,200 for this, I'll lend the person $600 and I'll charge 17% interest. They take no risk because they take your collateral, they physically own your collateral and they know they can flip it immediately on eBay for double what they lent you. So they have no risk and chances are, by the way, you're going to pay back and get your gold watch back or in this case, the James Altucher bobblehead. You're going to get it or bubble, whatever it's called, you're going to get, the pawn shop's gonna get their money back at 17 and 17% 17 more in 60 days. Now, it's, a, an, it's an unbelievable business model. Here's the problem pawn shops have, is sometimes they don't have the cash on hand to lend people because so many people are borrowing right now. So, and they can't borrow, pawn shops have a hard time borrowing money from banks. So a good business model right now and this is if you if you have cash, a good business model is to go to pawn shops that have been in business for a long time, so you know they have a track record, and to give them a line of credit against the collateral they're already holding. So I can charge, I can borrow money from the bank at 4% and I will lend out to the pawn shop for 20% a year, which they would be happy to take because they're charging 17% a month or for two months. So they're happy to take my money and I'll make you know the huge spread and I'll borrow from the bank to then lend at higher interest rates to the pawn shop or to the payday lender or whatever. There's a huge industry that focuses on individuals who don't have a bank. And if you could be kind of the bank for those pawn shops and payday lenders, you can make an enormous amount of money. And as far as I know, nobody is doing that. So uh, someone's asking, I've never taken a loan. Should I even if I don't need one? And the answer is, I'll just tell you my own experience. So I always pay, I have cash in the bank, but I always pay my rent a year in advance. I, I, I paid my rent on March 15th of this year and I paid for 12 months in advance. And instead of just wiring the money out of my cash, we were starting to lock down and I figured, you know what? Cash is king. I don't want to take any chances at all that like, let's say the stock market closes or the banks have a problem, whatever. So I borrowed money off of a stock. Again, I pay almost 0% interest and I wired that money from a brokerage account. I wired that money for a year's worth of my rent. So I'm even, because I'm getting almost 0% interest rates, I'm borrowing, as long as I have a use for it, I'm not just letting it sit in the bank because then I'm not making the interest. But if I have a use for it, I will, I, I will borrow the money, absolutely, because always borrow at 0% interest if you have a use for it. If, you, if it's 20% interest, like if it's a pawn shop, no, I won't borrow the money. 0%, I'd rather have the cash than, and debt than worry about my, my debt. So, uh, have I invested in any pawn shops? Yeah, I've, I used to invest in stocks that were, back in 2002, 2003, the way I made a living was I date, often day traded, but I invested long-term in pawn shop and payday lender stocks because so many people were going broke in 2001, 2002, that the pawn shop business was surging. I knew this because part of my family owns pawn shops. And so I invested in every public company I could find that was a pawn shop or a, a payday lender. And uh, uh, that, was, that was very lucrative because they all surged over the next year. And I bet you 
pawn, I, I know for a fact actually, because I know my family, pawn shops are doing enormous business right now. And everybody, and, and again, pawn shops, imagine them as like banks, but instead of loaning money out at 4% interest, they're loaning money at the equivalent of several hundred percent interest. Uh, rent to own, good deal? I don't know. I don't, probably, but I don't know. Uh, someone's asks, I'm writing a book about how to heal from heartbreak. I have lots of stories, some funny and some outrageous. How vulnerable do I share these experiences without coming off bad uh, and then or entertaining? If you're writing a book about how to heal from heartbreak, I wanna hear everything. I wanna hear absolutely everything. When you're writing, don't hold back. Don't, don't you can't, if you, there's, a, there's, a, there's already a thousand books about how to heal from heartbreak. So you have to say something that nobody else has said. So like a lot of the books on how to heal from heartbreak are written by psychologists. And so they're kind of quoting experiences they have with their clients and they're quoting, quoting scientific research. So it sounds like the way you could be different from the classic how to heal from heartbreak book is by telling your own experiences. And so if your experience was, oh, I cheated on my spouse, but then I wanted to get back together and we were back together and then she broke my heart when I had cancer or he broke my heart when I had cancer. Uh, that's share everything because people, the book is not about you. The book is about the reader, but the reader is not gonna just listen to your techniques. The reader has to know why am I listening to this person? Why is this person up on a pedestal so much that I am willing to buy their book and listen to their techniques. You store techniques are good, but they're think of techniques like a like a boat, and you're the river that the boat sails on to get from one location to the other, to get from you to the reader. So you always stories are the river. You always have to provide a story to prov so that the techniques that you're describing about how to kind of go across to the other side to the reader. And, you, and in order to tell a good story, you have to be vulnerable. This, this one quote, this one mantra, I always think to myself when I'm writing, vulnerability buys freedom. The more vulnerable you are, uh, the more free you are for everything you do. So when I started, in 2010, I started sharing about all the times I went personally broke. And before that, I was on, I was always writing this financial stuff and I was, good at it, I knew what I was doing with investing, and I, and I always was afraid, oh, if I write about the times I went broke, no one's gonna listen to me on financial stuff. So I was afraid, I was afraid I wouldn't get on CNBC, I was afraid the Wall Street Journal wouldn't let me write for them, I was afraid I would never publish a book again. And finally I was like, you know what, screw it, I cannot be afraid anymore of what I'm writing. And I started writing, you know, I just started off an article like, you know, this is the day I went broke. And I described it completely. And I started, I started my audience multiplied by a factor of 10 or maybe even 50 because I started being vulnerable. And, and people were like, oh my gosh, you never, no one's gonna ever let you invest again. CNBC is never gonna call you again. But actually, I've gotten so many more opportunities because people know that I'm trustworthy, that when I say something, it's true. And CNBC started calling me more than ever because I was trustworthy. And so vulnerability buys freedom. I'll give you an example. You ever see the movie Eight Mile uh, with Eminem? So Eminem is this up and coming rapper and he keeps losing these rap battles. But then at the end, he finally just breaks down. He's at the final rap battle and he, he says, I know everything you could say about me. You know, I am white. I, I did grow up in a trailer. Uh, my mom did this. I did get beaten up by these guys. You did sleep with my girlfriend. So he starts just being very vulnerable and then boom, that's how he wins the rap battle at the end of the movie, that closes the movie. And then he decides, and then he's free. He doesn't even wanna do rap battles anymore, he quits. So vulnerability buys freedom. If you wanna write, be as vulnerable as possible and, 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 and you know, by the way, that's gonna be entertaining because everyone's a natural voyeur. You ever stay in a hotel and you just you put your ear and a glass against the wall because you want to hear the couple in the room next to you having sex? Or is this just me? I don't know. <laughs> but 
uh, we all are voyeurs. And so when we read and we get that voyeuristic thrill without having to like spy on anyone, that's the best reading. That's the most entertaining re reading. So vulnerability buys you freedom and it buys you entertainment and people trust you. That's why you're suddenly free. And again, I've got more financial opportunities after 2010, after I start, started writing all my shit down, after I started sharing everything, I got more opportunities than I could have possibly imagined. Um, one time this one company, no, I won't even get into that, uh, but people's attention is limited. How can new writers stand out from the crowd? That's a great question. Well, you stand out from the crowd by being vulnerable or, uh, or you always want to, again, I've always said this, you always want to say something no one else is saying. So, and you don't want to be a contrarian for the sake of being a contrarian. So a lot of times people say, oh, James just wrote, don't send your kids to college or, or he wants his daughters to be lesbians. He's just trying to be a contrarian. Actually, no, I don't believe in college at all. And I'm, I, I, I would be ecstatic. I like girls would be ecstatic if my daughters were lesbians. But, uh, uh, you know, and you could say, well, how vulnerable can you be? What if your story is embarrassing for your family? So here's the rule I have. I, in my writing, I will always hurt me, but I'll never, I'll, I'll try. I'll never hurt anybody else. Now, sometimes by accident, I have hurt somebody else, but if they call me up right away and they say, what are you doing? I take it down immediately. So one time when my daughter was little, I, I thought she had sharded and I wrote this in an article. She was 10 years old. She called me and she was like, daddy, I don't know if I could trust you anymore. Like, and so I took down the article right away, but it was, you know, I'll always take it down if I've, if, if, if I've hurt someone else, but I'm, I'm always happy to hurt me, but I'll never hurt anyone else. That's my rule. Um, so how to make money if you're a 19 year old living in Europe and Corona is out there. So let's, let's talk for a second. This is a great way to make money no matter who you are. So here's the, so I, I, wa I was watching this, it was a really good video yesterday uh, on Instagram, I think, by Gary Vaynerchuk. Some of you might know who he is. All of you probably do. And he was telling someone, don't do, a, if you do a sales funnel, that means you're a bad salesperson. And, and he was telling this woman on the video that she's a bad salesperson. And I sort of agree with him, but it, it's sales funnels are different than sales. And so I'll describe the difference, but this is, this is gonna lead into how to make money if you're 19 years old, or if you're 69 years old, if you're living in Europe, or if you're living in Antarctica, if you're living in India, you can make money wherever you are. And, and I don't wanna be these like, oh, make money from home kind of people, but the reality is right now, it's easier than ever to make money from home. And so what you do is, uh, first off, Think, of, think in terms of these categories. Make money, uh, get laid, lose weight. Make money, get laid, lose weight. Those three items. So making money is like stocks or gold or real estate or I don't know. Uh, there might, there's, there's millions of, you know, here's, I'm gonna send you an idea a week for a business you could start, whatever. Um, get laid is of course kind of the pickup industry and if you get, I have a newsletter about uh, meeting uh, if you have a newsletter about you know, meeting people of the opposite sex, that's the get laid category. And the lose weight category is of course, online diets. So now you start, po you, you find out what your unique stance is. So a friend of mine a few years ago, I've talked about him before, he did the, uh, the what would Jesus eat diet. You could imagine for Muslims, it would be almost the same diet, but it would be what would Muhammad eat diet. Or you know, you can do, uh, you know, do you, you know, do idea sex. So you could take the paleo diet and merge it with a vegan diet. And you could say the only paleo vegan diet with, uh, with intermittent fasting and how do you exercise if you're a paleo vegan and we'll give you, you know, new ideas and new recipes every week for paleo vegans. And it'll be $5 a month. But what you should do first is start posting articles on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, even TikTok, articles, videos, whatever, do a podcast, interview other paleo vegans, get all the scientific research down about why this is a good diet and what are the good recipes and give stuff away for free. And then you think, 
okay, you want people to sign up. Now you've been posting articles, you've been posting it all for free, you're not getting paid yet. Now you encourage people like, hey, glad you're following my articles on LinkedIn. Now, if you wanna see my 99 best recipes for being a paleo vegan, I'm gonna give that away for free. I just need your email address so I know where to send it. And you have to sign up for my email list. So now you've created this email list. No, no money has changed hands yet. Everybody signs up for free. And now you send your paleo vegan, your, your top 99 recipes, you just send it for free. Your special report, maybe you have two special reports, maybe three. Um, maybe you have, you're gonna send the best paleo vegan restaurants, a list of them from all around the world. Whatever, you're gonna give them for free to everybody who signs up for your email list. Now you have an email list. This is the funnel. So you went from the free LinkedIn to the slightly smaller email list, and now slightly smaller is the list of people who are gonna pay you. So I actually, you know, now that I think about it, I wouldn't create a, a, a four pay paleo vegan diet. Keep that free and send that out every day or every other day. But now maybe you have friends who have a course that you believe in on how to monetize a blog. Or maybe another friend has another diet. Here's the uh, vegan exercise plan. Or maybe here's another friend. Here's, you know, how to um, invest in vegan stocks. I don't know. And, and they are selling it. So you, you advertise their products on your email list and you tell why you like them. You have to be sincere and authentic because people will, will know. You, you tell why you like these things and you can take an affiliate fee. So you, get, you do a 50-50 split with these other people. So again, you can make money from home. You don't even have to build your own online course or online newsletter, although you can and that's more money, but that has another set of headaches, which is you have to accept credit cards, you have to handle customer service. What I would do is, Give out everything for free. Give all of your knowledge for free. Become an expert in something. Skip the line and become an expert. You can use IdeaSex, combine two diets. You can use, combine two different investing strategies. You can, you can um, do all sorts of stuff. And, uh, you know, like I just got this email, five ways to protect yourself in a divorce. I'll, I'll be honest, I once, 15 years ago or 12 years ago, I once subscribed to a product, how to deal if your partner cheats on you. So uh, there's all sorts of newsletter products out there. But, but so, so again, the funnel is start, give away all your knowledge for free on LinkedIn, Medium, Huffington Post, you know, your blog, uh, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, podcasts, whatever. Give everything out for free. Then make a special report and say you can get this special report for free by signing up for me, my email list. Now you have an email list. So the funnel now has gotten a little thinner. And now, you make money, the easiest way to make money is get all your friends who are making other products and sell their products and take a 50-50 split if people click to those products from your email. And that is a hugely profitable way to make money and still uh, uh, do, spend as little effort as possible and still give away all your content for free. I wish I had done that model actually in retrospect. I ended up selling some investment newsletters. I think, um, Okay, here's a question. Should I mention my husband being arrested and his story in my book? Yes, mention your husband being arrested. In fact, start off your book. It was, it was 6 a.m. and there was a pounding on the door. The next thing I knew, someone, I, I didn't know who it was. I thought it was terrorists. Someone kicked in my door and men with guns and hoods were running all through my house and I was being held at, at gunpoint by an AK-47 from a guy with a hood and goggles on and they were grabbing my husband and tying him up and and they hit him start that's your first paragraph so yes you have to you have to mention your husband being arrested else no one's going to want to read it like a book about how to love yourself if you're just going to do that i would recommend my friend kamal's book love yourself like your life depends on it and then after that i'd recommend 50 other books your your story is your fingerprint. It's unique to you. And your ability to express your story is, is gonna be directly correlated to how much money you make from the book. So, um, uh, what was it like interviewing John McAfee? So the other day I interviewed John McAfee. I think Jay can tell you, but I think we're releasing it on Monday. And, oh no, Jay, when did we release John McAfee? Do you know? Anyway, we might have already released it. I have no idea. But I interviewed John McAfee the other day. John McAfee he started McAfee, the virus software company. So we all have McAfee software on our computer that protects against viruses. And uh, Jay, can you tell me on this even when, where, 
when John McAfee's being released. Anyway, John McAfee is batshit crazy. He's a billionaire or whatever. He was living in Belize because he was running away from taxes. And in Belize, he was like charged with murder and then he went on the run and he escaped back to the US. He's been on my podcast a bunch of times since then. He ran for president as a libertarian and he is insane. So he's, I asked him, I was just joking around. I'm like, where are you? And he said, oh, I can't tell you. And I'm like, why can't you tell me? And he's like, well, I'm on the run from the US government. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, oh, I gotta catch you up on what's been going on in my life. So, uh, oh, Jay says John McAfee's coming out the Monday after this Monday. But, and I'm like, so he said, yeah, I, I, owed, I owed all these taxes and the government started coming after me and I didn't find out till the last minute they were about to arrest me. So I get on my yacht with my wife and we went to the Bahamas, which, which they can't extradite you if, for taxes from the Bahamas. But then the US government started pressuring the Bahami, Bahamanian government, I don't even know how to say it, um, to, to extradite him. So he got back on his yacht, he went to Cuba. So he said Cuba would definitely not extradite a US citizen, but even there, the US government, the, the Cuba government told him, John, we're sorry to do this to you, but the US government's pressuring us. We told them you, are, you already left. And so John McAfee left Cuba. He went to the Dominican Republic and, and the Dominican Republic, the US government put the pressure. He had to leave. They said, why don't you go to England? And so he knew, of course, that that was a trick. So he left the Dominican Republic and now I don't know where he is. He, I said, come on, you could tell me. I'm not gonna tell anybody. Of course, I'm gonna tell everybody. And he said, no, no, I'm in an undisclosed location. So he's, and he, he was going on and on. He's very pessimistic, by the way, about what's gonna happen to the US, but that's because he's also on the run from the US. So he's a little bit biased, but he basically said, you guys are a bunch of idiots. You, you took this virus and you shut down a $20 trillion economy. You know how many people are gonna die from that? So he kind of, I kind of agreed with that part, but he, he basically said it's too late for the US economy. I don't agree with him on that. He said, you're all gonna fall apart and within two months, the dollar is gonna be worth four cents. And I don't agree with that. If you want, listen to my podcast from this past Monday. I had the deputy chairman of the St. Louis Federal Reserve and I specifically asked him, tell me what you guys are thinking. What is the Federal Reserve thinking about all the money printing and hyperinflation and so on? And he explained it to me step by step why there won't be hyperinflation or inflation. And I, I believe him over John McAfee. If I had to weigh the two, John McAfee is entertainment and this other guy was the St. Louis, deputy chairman of the St. Louis Federal Reserve. But John is batshit insane, and I told him that to his face. Um, where is the best, well, you know what? I wanna, I wanna actually look at one headline. So there's this headline on CNN, all of how each state is gonna reopen. And I think it's interesting. It looks like most states are gonna probably reopen either the last week of April or first week of May. So the last week of April is next week. First week of May is the week after. And, and some of the states are gonna be restricted. They're gonna do, go from shelter at home to safety at home. But it seems like most states are gonna three quarters reopen by at latest May 3rd or May 5th or May 15th. And a lot of them are starting to reopen starting April 27th. Georgia, I think starting to reopen yesterday or, or today. But this is weird, Montana, if you travel to Montana, if you like land, I don't know, what is it, Helena? If you land in Helena in the airport, you have to, you're required to quarantine for 14 days. Does anyone wanna to go to Montana so, so badly that they're willing to land in Montana and then self-quarantine, I guess in the days in motel or whatever, where are you gonna quarantine for 14 days? N nobody, nobody's ever gonna to go to Montana again and maybe that's the point. Here's, you know, I, one time I was at a networking dinner meeting and there was a lot of kind of, there was one guy, uh, this is the level of people. So the, the head of TCBY yogurt, that yogurt chain was there at this, it was a networking dinner, it was only like 10 of us. The head of the TCBY yogurt chain was there. The guy sitting next to me, he had like, really like just great white hair and a nice, but like a dark gray suit with a red tie, white shirt. And he was really just like a very good fit 60 year old guy. And I said, and he said, you, sh 
he was telling me, you should live in Kansas. Like you could get like a six bedroom house in Kansas for almost nothing. And I'm like, you know, you look like a politician. You should run for governor of Kansas. And he said, how did you know? Did someone tell you? And I'm like, no, what are you talking about? He said, I am the governor of Kansas. So that was the kind of person who was at this uh, networking dinner. But my big suggestion in this networking dinner, this Montana made me think about it, was that I suggested, just as an afterthought, I suggested, why did we put Israel in the middle of the Middle East, in Israel in the, in the middle of like 18 different countries that want to bomb Israel? It doesn't seem like the healthiest place for Israel to be. And I get it for biblical reasons, and it was right after World War II, and you know it was important to Israel to go back to the homeland. But wouldn't it have been so much better if you said to all, hey, we'll just, we'll just turn Montana into Israel. No one lives in Montana anyway. Let's just put Israel in Montana. And so you're going to get all these smart scientists living right in the U.S. and make it like protected, like a protectorate, kind of like the Virgin Islands or whatever. And I thought that would have been a great solution instead of putting Israel right in the exact place where we've had all of these wars. How many wars have we, have we personally fought in uh, the Middle East because we, because, because we put their enemy right in the middle of them. And I'm not saying anything about we should change it or whatever, but anyway, I suggested this, and, 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 I, and this was part of my argument. We, I suggested in this networking meeting that we shouldn't go to wars anymore, and, and why are we doing these things that cause all these wars? And the, the head of the TCBY yogurt, he slammed, finally he slammed his hand down on the table and he's like, I will not have some kid tell, I've been in three wars. I will not have some kid telling me when or when we shouldn't go to war. I was 42 years old then, but anyway, um, I, I was suitably shamed. I didn't talk for the rest. The governor of Kansas no longer wanted me to move to Kansas. Unless, let's see when Kansas is reopening, hypothetically. Um, Governor Laura Kelly issued a stay-at-home order, but it's been extended to May 3rd. And uh, I guess it'll be, a, she says it'll be a gradual rollout. All right, we're, I think what's gonna happen is two or three states are gonna open and they're gonna like, their economies are gonna surge. And then suddenly every state is gonna be rushing to open. So I think that's what will happen. All the states are complaining, they wanna have bailouts. No, do not, if you're California and you've been running up debt for 50 years, don't ask for a bailout from all the states that were, and, and by the way, New York State's guilty too. Don't ask for a bailout from all, and that means all the taxpayers from every other state has to bail out California and New York. No way, that's not going to happen. But do my suggestion, if you're California, sell off, why are you running public highways? Let companies that are more efficient run the public highways. You haven't fixed your infrastructure in 50 years. Do you know the average bridge right now in the US is 65 years old, but also the average bridge was never intended to be built for more than 40 years. These bridges are all about to collapse. So sell off your bridges and your highways. California, sell off Berkeley, sell off UCLA, sell off UC Santa Cruz, just sell it to private equity firms or whatever, hedge funds, because those colleges are gonna go out of business anyway in the long run, because no one's gonna, people are gonna stop going to college eventually after this uh, uh, pandemic. So uh, uh, anyway, more questions. I'm gonna go back to Jay's list. Uh, how to pre-sell a book before it's created? Such a great question. So here's, there's two answers and they're both fascinating. Here's a great way to do it. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you afterwards how I use this idea. How you could pre-sell a book, no problem. Here's what you do. You put, let's say you have five ideas for books. Make little ads for all five books as if you had already created them and now you're selling them. So, so make ads and for a hundred dollars budget for each one, do, do ads on Facebook and target a pretty general audience, but maybe target your interests or whatever and do ads on Facebook and you can measure them on Facebook. You don't even have to, those ads don't have to click on anything and then people will be like, oh, what was that all about? And then they'll forget about it but you can see on Facebook how many people clicked on each ad. So of your five ideas, you can see who, which ad was, which book idea was the most popular. That's the book you should write. So then you know it's a good idea. Or you could do a Kickstarter. For, uh, here's why I love Kickstarter. And by the way, the, CEO, the founder of Kickstarter is coming on my podcast as well. But here's why I love Kickstarter. 
Kickstarter is not just about raising money for your idea. Kickstarter gives you an audience before you're even done with the idea. So let's say I have an idea. I'm gonna write, I'm gonna write, um, uh, well, uh, I did a Kickstarter, right? I did a Kickstarter where I wanted to buy, I wanted to raise $100 million to buy Greenland. And, you know, Kickstarter actually ended up uh, shutting it down and they thought I was making a joke. But on Kickstarter, people give you money to support your idea, but they get rewards if they support your idea. So I had, if you gave me $10 to buy Greenland, you could be a citizen. If you gave me $100, you could be an Earl of Greenland. If you give me $1,000, you could be a, a Duke or a Prince of Greenland. If you give me $10,000, there will be a national holiday named after you. In uh, $20,000, you could have 1,000 acres on Greenland. And so people were actually sending me up to $1,000 uh, ultimately, but then I got shut down. But here's the point. If you were doing that with a book or a game or a project that you're doing, you, what happens is thousands of people, let's say you want to write a book. Here's the title of the book. It's a, let's say, let's just, I'll make this up. It's a 14 volume history of, of the coronavirus pandemic. And if you, you know, if you give me $5, you know, on Kickstarter, you get to, I'll send you a di free digital version of all 14 volumes. If you give me $40 on Kickstarter, you'll get the hardcover. If you give me a hundred dollars, on Kickstarter, I'll sign it and send all the books to you. If you give me $1,000 or $500, I'll send you all my books I ever write again for free, something like that. And now thousands of people support you. Those, that's your built-in readership. So you will send them the book as soon as it's ready. And those are your first reviews. They're all gonna be five-star reviews because they, they put money, they were excited to help you and support your project. So those are your first reviews. Those are people who will share it. That's how your book will get out there. Kickstarter is a great way to market a book idea. And by the way, if, you, if it doesn't get any funding, then you know the book idea is bad. And even if someone's already donated, all the money is returned if you don't make, make your funding goal. So this is a great way to test out an idea and create a built-in audience that you could message about, you know, updates about the book and so on. So Kickstarter is a great way to see the ideas. Facebook, using Facebook ads is a great way to see the ideas. I'll tell you a little story. When I wrote the book Choose Yourself, before the book, before the book even, before I even sat down to write the book, I was having a discussion with Tucker Max and Ryan Holiday about what the book title should be. And my original idea was the Choose Yourself era, but it kept sounding, whenever I said the word era, it sounded like error, and I didn't like it. So Tucker Max suggested, how about pick yourself? And Ryan Holiday suggested um, something like, you know, live the dream. And I threw out there, how about Choose Yourself? So I made Facebook ads for all these different titles and I put them on Facebook. 80% of the people clicked on Choose Yourself, something like 40% or 20, you know, some small, much smaller percentage clicked on Pick Yourself, then Ryan's idea, then the Choose Yourself era. So I knew, I knew because I focus grouped it with these ads very cheaply, it's an experiment. And I always like to do things with experiments before, before you commit thousands of hours into a project, experiment as much as you can to see if the idea works. And so this was, my, this was my experiment to see if the title and even the theme of Choose Yourself would work. And it did. A lot of people clicked on the ads. I sold out of my budget within one day, uh, at least on the cho uh, for the Choose Yourself one. I didn't sell out of the budgets on the other ones. And I knew what the title would be. And that title turned out to be the best title for that book. Uh, will the unemployed become entrepreneurs? Yeah, and, and people always say to me, not everybody is an entrepreneur, you know. That's not really true. Everybody is an entrepreneur, they just don't know it. Not everybody is cut out to be an employee, which is kind of like a voluntary serfdom, but everybody can be an entrepreneur. You can, you can, buy, you can buy cheap products on one website and then sell them on Amazon and suddenly you're an entrepreneur. But go to Alibaba or go to um, Ways to Cap, W-A-Y-S, the number two, C-A-P.com which is the African version of Alibaba, and I think you can get stuff much cheaper there now that trade is getting a little better in Africa. Go to ways2cap.com. You could find something like laundry detergent on ways to cap You could resell it for three times the amount on Amazon, and now you're uh, an entrepreneur. So I, one friend of mine, I wrote this down in an article, one friend of mine read the article, and he started doing it. And he told me within 
30 days, he made his first million. He showed his parents how to do it. Within 90 days, they made their first million. And so ideas like that work. And I described to you earlier um, how to make money with an email list and how to build uh, a mini funnel, not a full sales funnel, but a, a funnel, but a mini funnel. That idea always works. You will definitely make money. So start, but the real secret is start writing down 10 ideas a day so you can start coming up with idea after idea because the first idea you come up with is not gonna work. Maybe the 50th idea will work. You come up with 10 ideas a day and and you're within three months, six months, you'll be like an idea machine and then you'll finally start coming up with more good ideas consistently and then you'll also start thinking, well, how can I experiment in order to see if this idea is good? So experimenting is the key to entrepreneurship. That's one of the keys. An experiment has little downside and huge upside. So when I even when, when even when I did this Kickstarter to 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 buy Greenland, I had no downside. The downside was nothing for me. It was just the time I took to write the article and come up with the awards and research Greenland enough. And I put this up. You would think, well, it was kind of a joke. So what was my upside? Well, if it got if it caught fire in the media, maybe there would be huge upside. Maybe I would end up writing a book about it. Or at the very least, there was upside in that I wrote stories about it, I wrote articles about it. Uh, I'm getting the founder of Kickstarter on my podcast. I got familiar with crowd, I never done a crowdfunding project before. So now I'm making a game. I'm about to launch a Kickstarter for crowdfunding, uh, for, for crowdfunding this game idea. So that one experiment has given me huge benefits, even though it ultimately didn't work. I did not buy Greenland, obviously, with that experiment. So experimenting is always a great idea and, and, and should be the theme of, of every project you do. So if even, even when I wrote the book, The Power of No, the first thing I did was I wrote an article called The Power of No. And I just very kind of slyly outlined the book. In, in my article and I got back, it was the most engaged article I wrote in 2014. So I knew this was gonna be a great book. So that's when I decided, okay, I'll do the book, The Power of No. By the way, how did I come up with that title, The Power of No? The day Choose Yourself came out, uh, a publisher called me, Hay House, and they published Wayne Dyer, uh, uh, a bunch of like self-help people. And, and they asked me, well, what do you wanna write a book about? We'll do any book you want. What do you want to write a book about? This is the day Choose Yourself came out. And I said, how about we just take the power of now and remove the W? And I said that as a joke. And they said, perfect. So that's how I ended up doing it. Then I had to figure out what to write about. But that's how I came up with the power of, of no title. And then I realized when I outlined the idea and I posted it as an article and I got the biggest engagement I've ever gotten, I realized this is a topic that's very exciting to people. I wrote the book and it became uh, a big bestseller. It was a, a Wall Street Journal bestseller, a USA Today bestseller. Uh, it wasn't a New York Times bestseller, although I sold more copies than other bestsellers. Uh, so let me see. I want to also. Uh, I want to. I want to look at. Did we come up with the BS headline of the day? Uh, because if not, I want to find one. But oh, bleach and sunlight might kill the virus on a park bench but can be harmful to the body. I don't know. Can someone get this correct on sunlight just for once? Does sunlight help because it has vitamin D or does it hurt? It kills the virus, but it doesn't, but it could be harmful. I don't know, I, this article, sunlight might kill the virus, but it also can be harmful. This headline means nothing to me. So by contrast, let's look at my favorite website. Which with, and this is a website, if you ever want accurate news that's up to date, this is the only accurate news website I can find. I can't find accurate news. I'm so glad I found this site because it's the only place where there's accurate news. Cosmopolitan.com and uh, here's, here's the latest headlines. Um, what Megan and Harry actually texted her dad. That's great. I'm sure that's the actual way they texted her dad. I'm sure that's actual real news. And you know what? Ever since Megxit, I want to see what, what, what Megan texted her dad. Here's, and then the next, very next article, Megan's very important. She's more important than coronavirus. The very next article, the sad way Megan heard of her dad's heart attack. 
So I didn't even know he had a heart attack. This is news for me now. Um, here's, a, here's one that I'm definitely gonna click on. Uh, is it 2020 or 3020? Because these gadgets are fire. Oh, I, want, I always wanna see 16 awesome gifts for women who love tech gadgets. Well, I have four daughters and a wife, so I have five women who love text, uh, tech gadgets. Oh, here's a light and massage therapy hairbrush that's $89 in sharper image. Here's a Miami Sunrise alarm clock, $79, uh, and it's a very nice sound. It has, uh, it mimics a peaceful sunrise. I'm not sure, a sunrise doesn't sound like anything, so I'm not sure how it does that. Uh, let's see, smart video calling. This is way better than trying to hold your phone in the air to get the perfect shot. The camera on the portal, it's portal from Facebook. Oh, this is a Facebook product. I, $229, I didn't even know Facebook sells cameras. You can move around the entire room and always remain in focus. I'm definitely getting this. So I, my life actually just improved because I went to Cosmopolitan as opposed to CNN. So uh, I, life doesn't get any, what, else, what other news do you need? Let me just find one. Oh, here's phone soap, a phone sanitizer. Finally, I've been waiting for that. Here's a towel warmer, another good product. I'm gonna get all of these. A mini wall charger, I don't know, uh, I don't know. Ultrasonic jewelry cleaner. All right, I don't know, I don't wear jewelry, but maybe my wife does. And I'll answer one or two more questions. Uh, am I playing chess? Not at the moment. I could at some point. I've been, I have played chess earlier today. I always play chess for about an hour a day. For me, games are a good way to, being in, to practice being in high stress situations without actually being in real stressful situations. So when you're playing a, a, a good game like chess or checkers or poker or even bridge or hearts, there's always gonna be a point where you have to make a stressful decision and everything feels at stake because you're invested in winning the game. And it's a good way, I love playing games because it's a good way to learn the psychology of competition, the psychology of defeat. Uh, getting better at a game um, forces you to learn all the micro skills of that game and I'll describe what I mean by that on, on Monday. I'll describe the micro skills of business and investing. On Monday, I'm gonna describe the micro skills of investing because I think that's a very, uh, uh, people don't realize, there's no skill called investing. You're not a good investor. You're, you're good at a style of investing. There are various micro skills you have to be good at. You have to be good at managing risk. You have to be good at money management. You have to be good at due diligence. You have to be good at uh, understanding all how to spot opportunities in the stock market. So I'm gonna describe that more on Monday. Um, do I recommend to try to write two books at a time? Why not? I'm always thinking of other books while I'm writing a book. So if you're an idea machine, it's gonna be natural for you every single day that you'll come up with more ideas, for more and more ideas for books and for, for TV shows and for products every day. So, and for businesses, Sometimes you have to rein yourself in and focus, but you always want to keep exercising the idea muscle. And again, idea sex is great for that. So, you know, I just I just told you an idea that I came up with earlier, which is, uh, be you know, because pawn shops is such a great business model, but nobody wants to lend money to pawn shops. It's actually a great business model to lend money to solid, stable pawn shops at huge interest rates because they can't get interest, they can't get loans from the banks and they charge up to 100% a year on their own loans. So they don't mind paying 20% a year because they're charging 100% a year. And so you can give them, anyway, this is an idea if you wanted to start like your own mini bank or hedge fund or whatever. Uh, I, that's the type of idea I could see a hedge fund doing. Um, I've seen some very weird hedge fund ideas. And so the other important thing is we talked about how to make a, what I'll call a mini sales funnel where you actually don't sell anything and you just give everything for free and you give a lot of valuable information for free, but you could still make millions of years, millions of dollars a year, no matter where you're living, um, just by doing these, what's called affiliate deals. And I'm gonna share this video, I'll definitely share this video on YouTube by tomorrow. I'm gonna share this video for the next 24 hours on my IG stories in the live section, but I will definitely put it on YouTube tomorrow. I think it's really important the mini sales funnel. I don't really see businesses doing this with the mini sales funnel. Uh, also the idea of experimenting and, and why crowdfunding is so important for pre-seeding, for knowing if an idea is good and then for pre-seeding an audience. Uh, we also covered stuff about Montana and my 
humiliation at a networking dinner when I suggested Israel should have been put in Montana, something that nobody else but me seems to agree with. And uh, look, I would say have a good weekend, but what's the difference between Saturday and Sunday uh, and today? They're exactly the same. There's no tomorrow I'm going to do the exact same thing I did today 